Well, here we are. This is the last lecture before the review, and uh, a very important one, very interesting subject matter right now. So we ended up deriving Schrodinger's equation. I'm going to review that and then move, take a couple more steps forward with that. So we were talking about wave equations, and we had seen that the short wavelength limit led to a formalism, the Eichenol equation, that looked just like point mechanics. Okay. So that's what we had been working with. And I'll start off with, uh, I'll start off with this two column format one more time. So we had v squared, v, dt squared, right? We had the wave equation over here, and we had worked our way down to the Eichenhall equation. Over here we had the question mark, because, yeah, so dot, dot, dot. And then what we did was, <clears throat> let's go ahead and, yeah. C was the Eichenhall, and we had an equation for this. And that's what had led to our Eichenhall equation that looked like point mechanics. So finally, we were led to try this. B equals A, E to the I, S over H bar. Now, we had to, we had a formal, um, had a formal parallel between S and C, but of course, if that phase is dimensionless, S is not, so we have to divide it by H bar. We could divide it by any action, but of course, H bar was already known when this was first done. So when we divide it by H bar, then we, you know, we have the full analogy between these two. And I could also write this, B was equal to A, e to the i, and then when we expanded this, we had gradient c dot r plus c dt times t, and over here, we had a e to the i gradient s dot r minus e t and we have to divide by h bar. Okay. So what we ended up doing was right up here, I'm going to say what is the wave equation? Well, you need a wave speed. And what we found after this was that the Broglie relations, and in particular we found, here I'll just remind us, c is equal to root D, D, D rho at constant entropy. But what we found over here was that the speed of sound is E over root 2m E minus u. Okay. And from there we were able to get Schrodinger's equation. Okay, so I'll send this up. Schrodinger's equation answers this question right up here. So that's what we did. That's the end of the last notes. So we find with, and because we're doing the time independent one, well, we actually take this off of there. So with P equals P zero of X, Y, Z, e to the minus i e p over h bar, okay. then we find, and let's see what form we're going to write these in. We find, first of all, h bar squared over 2m uh, del squared phi 0 plus u times phi 0 is equal to e times phi 0. 
And then for the time dependent Schrodinger's equation, we find I H R E D D T does no longer phi naught times e to the minus I D T over H bar. And we could write Hamilton operator, but I'll just go ahead and write minus H bar squared over 2M L squared C uh, plus U T. So those are the two equations we find. Those are the famous equations of quantum mechanics. And we did it just based on this analogy that we had here. So yeah, we'll put them in a box for featuring them. So this second, the time dependent version is sort of a guess, because you go in um, with this for your time derivative, but now it's no longer, this phi here is no longer of this form, although it can be, but it doesn't have to be. Good. So. Schrodinger's equation, time independent, time dependent. So the next thing I'll just mention is what these are how, you're tip how you typically deal with these are the typical examples when you start studying quantum mechanics. Um, let's see which ones. Just the kind of the elementary applications. So applications. What we'll write here next. And we would have. Free particle and particle in a box and the third one I would say the quantum harmonic oscillator and of course the hydrogen atom. which is in fact just the, the Kepler problem. So the free particle, we would say u is equal to constant is equal to zero in this equation here. Okay. And it turns into an eigenvalue equation. But this is the unbounded version. Particle in a box, u is also constant. You can call it zero. So this would be the unbounded This would be bounded. So yeah, this is the one that's the actual eigenvalue problem. Harmonic oscillator, you have potential energy one half m omega naught squared x squared. Right? And then for the hydrogen atom, you have u is equal to minus alpha over r. So yeah, that's the Kepler problem. And interestingly, the, partic the free particle just turns into exactly what we have for our plane wave. Okay, maybe we should even tackle that. Free particle, this equation with this trial solution here will just give you a plane wave, which we already did when we were studying wave. And the particle in the box um, will give you essentially the, the standing waves in a box that we did. So that's back a couple lectures in your notes. You could either do them, but yeah, I'll, I'll just put that right here. So for the free particle plane wave solution. And the reason it's exactly what we did before is that this is the same, this is literally the same as the, with the different names of variables here, it's the same as the thing that we went into the plane wave problem with. Okay. 
because we set up our plane wave problem exactly like this, okay? except we're just minus i omega t. So that's why you get the same thing that we've already done. Particle in a box. Um, eigenvalue problem. So both of these we've done just with the renamed variables, um, different, slightly different boundary conditions. Um, the particle or the, the standing waves in that cuboid that we did a few days ago had the uh, derivative of the potential vanishing Whereas for Schrodinger's equation, it's the potential that vanishes um, at the boundaries. But, but that's just the difference between a sine and a cosine. It's, it's fundamentally the same problem and the same answer. OK, this one you'll do in a quantum mechanics class. Likewise, the Kepler problem. Okay. These all turn into eigenvalue problems because they're bounded eigenvalue problems. And you know, you get energy eigenvalues on all of these, among other things. So that would actually be fun if we had a little more time to just review these. But I can review you back to your notes and you can see how this equation here is going to give you the same solutions with slightly different names of variables that you had. Um, with the bounded waves in the cuboid um, right here and with the plane wave solution. So yeah, feel free to have a look at that. That's interesting. Um, these, of course, are is a big task to solve these right here. But uh, actually, it's a good, it's a good point uh, to mention right here, a couple things briefly. So yeah, suppose you're solving this equation with this ansatz here for the Kepler problem. You have to transform to spherical polar coordinates, right? That makes this a lot more exciting and, uh, and uh, involved. So you transform to spherical polar coordinates, and then you're going to have a condition on the bounded nature of the solution that's going to turn out giving you the energy eigenvalues of the hydrogen atom, or generally of the Kepler problem. So it is actually the same type of problem as these easy ones. Okay. The hydrogen atom is. And this is, you know, this is the wave equation that you use to solve these. Okay. Good. So what we want to do next is we'll set these up here. Is to note that you can solve these eigenvalue problems for energy eigenvalues, and you don't really know what this potential or what this wave function means. Okay, that's where they were historically when they were able to solve energy eigenvalues, but they didn't really know what the thing meant. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, work on that a bit. And also, we're going to take the time independent, or the time dependent Schrodinger equation, and analyze it. And what we end up, what we're going to end up doing is recovering the Hamilton-Jacobi equation and some other interesting stuff. So we're actually going to recover more than we put in. So it, the limit's going to be the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, but since we actually put more in here to go to go from here to here, we're actually going to get more back out. So let's uh, tackle that. Yet I have one last interesting assignment for you under this aspect too. So let's see here. So what we're going to do 
been working with this here. So now consider this equation star, this linear equation. Um, with, you know, I may as well use, let's go ahead and write it out. I H R D volt. Let's see what I have in my notes. Yeah. So this is the letter that's traditionally used. So we'll switch over to that. Nothing else different. Two M plus U C. Okay. So that's Schrodinger's equation. I've just chosen different Greek letters. But we're going to put this form of our wave function. So let C equal A of X, Y, Z, and T times E to the I, S of X, Y, Z, and T divided by H bar. Okay. So this is going to be the action, but it is not yet the action. Okay. And this would be an amplitude. The point of this exercise is that we're choosing A and S to be real functions. So this is the most general expression for a complex number, right? Real times E to the I times something real. So it's a fully general ansatz that we're going to take into here. So important that these are both real. Um, then I'm just going to get this started for you. I H bar D D T is equal to. We would have D A D T partial times E to the I S over H bar plus A, and then we're going to take the derivative here, so we will have I over H bar dS dT e to the I S over H bar. So I did the left side for you. You guys are going to want to do the right side. It's a bit more involved. But I have it here. It takes about one page. What I'm going to do is write down the result. But what you see is you have to be really careful with all your chain rule um, when you write this out. So A is a function of position and time. S is a function of position and time. It's up there in the, in the uh, exponential. And you've always got I over H bar to bring out whenever you do those derivatives up there. Okay. And then, of course, you multiply by the exponential again. So I will write for the bell squared equals divergence gradient of, of uh, whatever, divergence of, you know, I'll write out div grad div. So for that, you have a vector identity. Use divergence of a scalar times a vector equals f divergence of your vector plus a dot gradient of your scalar. So what we're writing here, f is a scalar function, so that's f of r, and a is a vector, so a of r. Of course, ours are of r and t, but we're just talking about the spatial derivatives right there. Okay, so you use that on the right side of this and crank out a bunch of you know, terms there. 
and what you're what you get when you're done is a real and an imaginary part. So that's where I'm gonna pick up this exercise. Let me just write a word or two. So then we also have minus h bar squared 2m del squared c plus mu of times c, right? This one is just a multiplication, mu times c equals, I'm going to write homework. And what you're doing is uh, using this there and collecting all terms, and I'll give you the answer so you know what you're working towards. In fact, it's more important that you just do it or leave room in your notes so that you've done this. <clears throat> That's why I'm not cranking it out for you, so that you guys have done this. More important than actually turning it in at this point in the semester. So, I no longer read that, but yeah, you saw that. Good, so let's write down what we find and discuss that. Like I said, we get a real we obtain a real and an imaginary part. Because we you know we've got a complex number and because these are both real here, we can divide them up into real and imaginary, right? They're not mixed. So we divide them up into real and imaginary, and here's what we get. And what's the best way to write it? So the real part that we're looking for, we get partial S C T plus gradient S squared over 2M plus U minus H bar squared over 2M del squared a divided by a, so you equals zero. So that's what we get from the real part. And we get it after a step where we divide the entire expression by a, okay? Um, and cancel, you know, we'll divide the whole thing by a and cancel the e to the isa part. So that's the real part and the imaginary part will be d a d t equals minus gradient a dotted into gradient s over 2m and I have a factor of 2 here, so I probably multiply top and bottom by 2 minus a del squared s over 2m. Let's put a bracket around that. It hasn't been set up to equal zero. Okay. So you'll get those two results after that calculation. And now we want to analyze these. These are really interesting to analyze. I'll just do that here on the right side. So the right side equation, or the right side of the real part equation, we can fit it here. We have gradient S squared over 2M plus U equals, I'm just going to rewrite it, minus DS DT minus go to the other side, plus h bar, let's get this right, yep, we go over here, plus h bar squared over 2m del squared a divided by a. So what is this here? Here, have 
out in red. This would be p squared over 2m plus u equals, remember minus bs dp is equal to h, where it's equal to e. I can go ahead and write h, doesn't matter, call it h. Right. That would be the Hamilton Jacobi equation if we didn't have this extra term here. So it's the Hamilton Jacobi equation plus something that's proportional to h bar squared. And one can say formally, if you take h bar to zero, and I'll say something about what that means, you can say if the limit of h bar goes to zero, then this is the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Right, and that's that's the Hamiltonian down below. But that's the Hamiltonian equation. Gradient S is of course equal to P, and so forth. So it's important to note here. In the limit as h bar goes to zero, we obtain Hamilton Jacobi equation. Which we expected because that's where we started from, right? But of course, we still have the second equation that we didn't know anything about. But yeah, that's what we have there. Now, what does this limit as h bar goes to zero actually mean? Because h bar is a constant and doesn't go to zero. Well, I'll say a little bit about that as well, directly underneath here. That's a figure of speech, but it uh, makes perfect sense. And let's have a look here. So star. So here's our explanation. Recall. The de Broglie relation, relations, but we're just going to use one of them. And we remember P was equal to H bar K. P is equal to H bar K. And we can write MV is equal to H bar times 2 pi, which of course is just H over lambda, and we can remember lambda is equal to, all right, h bar times 2 pi, and I'll introduce another letter, so lambda h bar over 2 pi times mv, that's probably the way you learned the, the Broly relation for the first time, so H over MG. That's probably the way you really learned it for the first time. Now, this is something good to focus on because on the one hand, when we were doing the Eichenhall equation, we said we're taking the small wavelength limit, right? The short wavelength limit. So the short wavelength limit corresponds to the small h bar limit, or really the small right side of this limit, and we see that what's required is that h bar be minuscule compared to mass time velocity, compared to linear momentum. And, you know, numerical examples, say, for just some mass of a gram or something, you know, show that lambda is then extraordinarily short, small, okay, short wavelength. So, that's the idea. Formally, you don't set h bar equal to zero. What you'd be saying is that term just becomes negligible you know, in any reasonable sense of the word. But actually, introducing this again is, is pretty good because we can see how h bar small, lambda small, and what h bar small actually means dynamically. 
So yeah, that's what we mean. H bar goes to zero formally, you just get rid of that term, and you have the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Oh good, that's that equation. Let's see what we're doing time-wise. Very good. So this this next equation, which looks like nothing in particular right now, is also really interesting. First of all, you'll notice that unlike the one that gave us the Hamilton Jacobi equation, I should have written some words here so you guys not write them down. Hamilton Jacobi equation. Okay. So the interesting thing about this second one is that H bar is not in there. So this one must be true of you know all systems. Oh, and by the way, the co these combined two equations here, and the unless have been erased. These two equations are fully equivalent to Schrodinger's equation, right? We took a completely general solution, a e to the i s, and uh, on the other hand, these are nonlinear differential equations, and you actually would not want to solve them for any quantum mechanics problem. Okay? But what you do is you get the insight that in this limit here, it's back to Hamilton Jacobi, and this one's very interesting as well. So let's analyze this one. So to analyze the, the imaginary part, multiply both sides by a, or multiply the entire yeah, multiply the entire equation by a. A, and then to the left side you're going to have a. D A D T is equal to D over D T. Um, actually, let's multiply it by two A. I see. That's just a formality. Yeah, multiply the whole thing by two times A. Because okay. now two A D A D T is D D T A squared. So we have that. Now when you multiply the right side by A, or the right hand side, we obtain, and this also is homework, we obtain plus or a minus sign, let me check this. Minus divergence of a squared gradient f over m. Is that right? Yes. And what that means, obtain that. That means we find the following equation, d over dt a squared plus divergence a squared gradient s over m is equal to zero. This one deserves a red box of its own. Yeah, so this is one that we have to look at and ponder for a moment. Yeah. So I'm going to send it up there. We'll look at it, point at it. So yeah, what does this look like here? 
Well, if we were to take A squared as a density, and we know gradient S over M in the classical limit is P over M, which is MV over M, which is just V velocity, we would be looking at a continuity equation. So that is actually very interesting. Go ahead and write that down. Okay, let's look at this thing, what I just said, and I'll write down what I just said. So a squared is a density, and gradient S over M, and by the way, this gradient S but it has to be thought of as a vector. Yes, it does. Good. Divergence of a vector, that's a scalar, so you got divergence of a vector. Good, that's good. Equals P over M equals MV over M equals V. Okay. So in that case, we're looking at row, V rho VT plus divergence of rho V equals zero. But that's our continuity equation that we learned about in fluid mechanics. Continuity equation. So we did get more out of this than we started with, so we have a continuity equation. And again, this equation here is, is true independent of h bar, so the classical limit, the quantum limit, this thing is holding true. Now, let's have a look at what a squared is. Note that we have c is equal to a e to the i s over h bar. Okay. So, so c c star is equal to a e to the i s over h bar times a e to the minus i s over h bar. So that's just equal to a squared. So we see what this is here. C, C star. That's what a squared is. Okay. And again, this is still fully general. So this actually already is the quantum mechanical continuity equation if you use this uh, unusual ansatz, which you don't use generally, although in the what's called the quasi-classical approximation, this ansatz is also used in Schrodinger's equation. Um, but here it's fully general, and therefore, you know, if you make the substitution, and you look up at the, the continuity equation of quantum mechanics, you'll see it actually has this form here. Um, or a very related form that can be transformed into this. Good, and, and so that is consistent with the interpretation of A squared as a probability density, namely C, C star, uh, right over here, which is this, complex conjugate squared, as a probability density. So this is just a note, quantum mechanics, C squared is the probability density. And uh, you can 
say that's the interpretation of this continuity equation, the probability density moves consistently with uh, classical mechanics, you know, especially when you take the classical limit, but it always does because this equation has no h bar in it. Good, let's see how we're doing for time. I think we'll wrap things up for today. This is a pretty much a perfect spot. Um, so what do we have in terms of what you guys are encouraged to do was those two calculations, getting the real imaginary part and then doing the transformation from the original version of this to the form where it looks like you know, multiplied by 2a and uh, to the form where it looks like and is a continuity equation. So I'll just underline continuity equation for your notes. Continuity equation right there. So good. After this, we'll just be doing review. Okay, so next time um, we'll be doing review. But this this subject, you see, it ties everything together very nicely. We were able to tie or tie the um, fluid mechanics, the waves, the classical mechanics, continuity equation. The whole thing comes together. Good. See you guys next time.